Diane Furwale and I'm going to be on the online prosperity show talking about public speaking for women. I want, you to, I want you to know that fear is a myth. It doesn't exist. It never has existed. And it's not even fear of public speaking that we're afraid of. So I want to tell you about what I do with my business called She Talks. And I'm going to take you through what you can do to overcome fear. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today, I've brought you the mind facilitator herself, Fair. Fair, how are you doing, my love? Hi, Prosper. I'm doing great. Thank you for bringing me on your show today. Well, fantastic. You've got a lot to prove because you're going to be the first episode of the year 2018 and we're really, really excited. So you're going to have to set the standard for what's to come. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I'm really hoping and sincerely um, excited to present to you Dr. Fair Whale. Right, she's an entrepreneur who is also an author. She writes, she speaks, she's a behavioral, uh, how do you say this, behaviorist. A mind facilitator with a degree in business, naturopathy, and media, and she's the proud creator of She Talks. Now, at She Talks, she has created a platform um, that helps women to deliver their messages and also to effect change within themselves and whatever family events that are happening with them around the globe. Now, if I could continue talking, I might just mess up this introduction. Fair, thank you so much for your time today. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you came about to create She Talks. Thanks, Prosper. And that's right, I've been very busy, as, as you've just shown, as you've just demonstrated. Um, she Talks is really, I'm very proud of She Talks. It's, uh, I began to think about it about two years ago. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with women. I'm, I'm a public speaker. I have been for a long time. And I love to do inspirational topics. And I love to talk about personal development and self-mastery. These are really valuable places for people to start before they even do public speaking because we need to remove the blocks so that we can get up and be authentically ourselves. So as a speaker, I was going out and trying different trainings, trying to upskill, and I wasn't finding what I was looking for, so I decided to do it myself. And that isn't to say that what is out there isn't good. I'm just saying I wanted something specifically for women that was based in personal development and self-mastery for women. And that's what I've designed. So I designed a customised public speaking platform for women. That's what it is. Yeah, based in neuroscience, behavioural science, theatre skills, radio skills, everything that I have acquired throughout my life, I bring to this, including my naturopathy skills, because as far as mindset is concerned, our neurotransmitters need to be fed through the food that we eat, and that affects our ability for focus, for clarity, memory, energy and so on absolutely well thank you so much for bringing into light something that never existed and um i have tried to search up uh you know the internet to see if there is any specific platforms like you have created for women um unless you're oprah not a lot of women are really <laughs> Um, right. supporting other women to actually be, do and have so on behalf of every female in the world I really do appreciate your noble gesture um, in creating this um, customized platform. Now obviously as we can you know all relate a lot of people would rather say and um, be the person in the in the coffin than actually be the person saying the obituaries. How is public speaking first of all, deemed as one of the most scariest thing uh, for people to tackle the thing that you are pushing forward for people to actually, um, you know, move, move with. What, what's the importance of people putting themselves on a pedestal and scaring themselves to death, um, <laughs> <laughs> especially if they're women? Sure, you have a really good point. Uh, the thing is, I just want to tell you that fear is a fallacy. 
Um, there's no such thing as fear of public speaking. It doesn't exist. It's just been bantied around. In fact, what it is, is it comes from in childhood where we've been trained in a sense by the people who love us. They meant well, but they've taught us to be very self-conscious. We've been told to get out of the mirror, stop being so vain. It's not about you. Uh, don't be so showy, be more humble. And so when it comes time for us to authentically be ourselves, which is a bold statement in itself, we tend to withdraw and hold back based on this conditioning that we've been brought up with. And society does it too, you know? That person, like, I love your introduction. It's bold, it's authentic, it's high energy. And it's actually the way we're going now in this end of the 20th century. We want people's authentic presence and we want their energy, whether that's calm and soft or high energy and evangelistical, but we want to see the real person. But in the past, we've had to be very controlled and polite and mindful of the other person and not so showy or shiny. So that's where fear comes from. Another thing too, fear is also based in all the little stuff about what people might judge us. They might see our flaws because we haven't made peace with our flaws. We think that other people are going to beat up on us about what we're not so great at. And they're probably not even going to see them anyway because they don't put the microscope on us like we do, you know, when we're in the quiet. So what people have, we tend to have this state of all this internal chatter that's telling us all these, um, telling us, not good enough, who are you to be the expert, why would you get up and speak, no one's going to be interested, what have you got to say, that sort of thing. And then on the other side, we have our dream that makes us take a bit of risk, but because of this internal chatter, we never, we never quite get out in the race, if you know what I mean. So what I'm doing with She Talks, the reason why it's not straight up public speaker training in the beginning, the first quarter of every workshop, the first third, is all about identifying your resistance, your biased beliefs that disable you from getting up to speak. And it's incredible how quick women suddenly realise, oh my God, that's not even my belief. I don't even think that's true. That's something that someone said ages ago that made me feel like I shouldn't get up and have a voice. So once that's done, women can then move into connecting to their authenticity, understanding what is my authentic state, where, when am I authentic, and when am I truly serving myself, therefore able to serve other people. Then they can start learning public speaking. Absolutely. I really align with that last statement that you just mentioned of serving other people because we're here to live, we're here to learn, we're here to contribute. So you can't, um, you know, live a fulfilled life if you're just doing it for yourself, you do it for other people. But then there's the learning part, all right? We learn, like you mentioned right at the start, that people learn as a kid and people learn as they grow up. Would you have had lessons while you're growing up about speaking or was that really something you grew up with? Because somebody might just look at you and say, oh, she's accomplished. She's got all these degrees. So that's the reason why she speaks like that and she's confident. Mm -hmm. I don't have any of that. So how do you then, you know, um, work with somebody who's in that sort of, um, you know, capacity of thinking? I didn't grow up with any of that. She probably grew up with a silver spoon, um, you oh. know, in her mouth. Sure. We all have advantages and we all have disadvantages and it's how we use them or make the best of them. Um, as children, we we're all confident. We really were. And then if we ever came up against a situation that we didn't know about, we might stand back and go, what is this? And, it, and how do I work around this or make this work? But as children, we're not going, oh, no, I can't go there. I'm too shy. We don't, we don't have that terminology. It's just about, do I want to play in this arena or don't I? Do I like it or don't I like it? Um, my parents, thank goodness, gave me a voice. In our family, we worked as a family unit in that all of us kids, me, myself and my two brothers, we all put in our opinion about um, 
what did we think about decision making so I've always had a voice my parents always encouraged us to say if we liked or didn't like their decision and then we would discuss it um, in any adult situations where the grown-ups were talking I never I never felt like I couldn't put my opinion in even when some people would say kids should be seen and not heard because my parents gave me a voice so I do understand some people haven't had that luxury if you like but it doesn't mean that they don't have a desire to share their message and in fact i think we all have a desire to share our message that's what we do when we go to parties when we meet friends or social gatherings we all want to share and be seen and know the other person so what that brings me to is the fact that no matter what you've been through or haven't been through no matter what you possess or don't possess if you have a burning message and you wish to share it, there is a way. In my life, Prosper, uh, there was a stage, yes, okay, so my parents gave me a voice and so therefore I had a, a, a fairly confident outlook. But then there was a stage in my life where things started changing. Um, a lot of traumatic events happened. I lost my mother to cancer and I remember deciding to not go to school so that I could sit at home with my mother and the nurse and be with my mum until the day she died. Then my father tried to take his life and I, I recall taking his police handgun out of his mouth and thinking, why doesn't my father love me anymore? Am I not good enough? Why has he abandoned me? And then from there, I guess I was pretty vulnerable. And what started happening was and which I realised later was a family member, in fact, my dad's best friend, had been grooming me for years and had been really inappropriate. But it was when he was drunk, so I was kind of thinking, he doesn't know what he's doing. And then after my parents died, he actually um, physically abused me and tried to rape me. And then after that, I was, in fact, um, drugged and raped at a party. In fact, I was gang raped. And I went through... I, I spiraled out of control. I, I felt like my whole belief system was shattered and I didn't know where I fit in the world. So I retreated and I became a hermit. And I went through post-traumatic stress. I went through chronic anxiety for several years. And so there were times I didn't leave home. And the thing is, I actually had a dream of being a public speaker. But I felt like because of what had happened to me, that would never be my future. So I thought that being in pain and depressed and having anxiety and living in constant fear and not trusting anyone was what I had to put up with from, the, from what had happened in my life. I thought that's what I was left with. But then I had a glimmer of hope. There was a part of me that just said, no, if... If I have a past that didn't have this story in it, that means I can get back there. So I started journaling and I started finding ways of overcoming this anxiety and grief and depression. In fact, to be honest, I wanted to take my life and made an attempt on my life until one day when my brother came to the door and said, Sissy, I need you. And here's the thing, I'd made a promise to my dad to take care of my brother and I suddenly realized that I hadn't made that promise to myself and here's the funny thing that is something that most people don't they're busy doing things for other people now yes it's a beautiful gift to serve other people but we have to serve ourselves first and if we're people pleasing or going around and making everyone happy but we're not and we haven't given to ourselves, that's a problem. We need to stop and make a promise to ourselves that we will serve our greater good, fill our cup before we fill others' cups. So that's what I did. I did that. And that is, in fact, that was in um, late 20s. And that was, in fact, when my whole life shifted for the better. And I can honestly say that what I went through was a blessing but it took a really long time, Prosper. It took a really long time for me to get back on my feet. But what I discovered 
during that journey with my journal was I discovered for one, the theory of change. I understood what created change in myself and in others. And when I did eventually get myself to a psychologist, they actually adopted that and they use it today. The theory of change. Yeah. Um, there's other, there's other um, concepts that I came up with. I, uh, I do a focus wheel to overcome blocks or resistant thinking, which I call uh, bias. We have a bias based on what we've experienced. And it's like the default button that we go to to solve problems, but we may not be solving the problem. So we kind of just bump up against our problem and then we, we kind of try to get back to life and we try to survive and then we try to fulfill our dreams. And, and we're just bumping around problems and dreams and never really able to break make the breakthrough to make the change. So this is why I'm really passionate about what I speak about and the workshops that I do. And that is getting through those blocks, getting, becoming aware of the biases that we hold. And then suddenly going, guess what? I have a choice here. I can actually shift my neurological state in fact, we can let go of the pathways that we've been using in the brain and create new ones. Thank you so much for that story right there. And I do appreciate and understand that once somebody has lost their mother, who usually is the pillar of the family, you know, the whole family goes dysfunctional and you sailed through, you didn't let that stop you and uh, deter you from being and doing, um, you know, your, what you had dreamt of right there so a lot of people would come through all of those um you know hurdles and then that would stop them dead in their tracks and you have also established that you know if you keep pushing if you keep pressing um going towards whatever it is that you want you know things usually um sort of work out so when you when somebody comes through to you now obviously that you you would have told them to go past those limiting beliefs how then are you going to be helping them um, you know, up until they're able to speak um, at least to like a, a whole, um, you know, audience that they never knew um, existed. Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to say, though, for instance, if we're here in our life and we know that we could be here or we want to be here, we tend to, people tend to sort of beat themselves up when they aren't moving fast enough or if they make mistakes and they, they think it's never going to happen for me and they give up when they've only gone a small part of the journey. And I just wanted to say that you just have to trust in the process and keep moving towards it because even if it's slow, if you keep creating the momentum, you will in fact reach there without a doubt because I had through that trauma um, through all of that experience, I reclaimed me, but I didn't know if I could ever be in the position that I am today. But I kept kind of treading the water and, and, and crossing my fingers and doing the work and hoping that what I thought might be possible was possible. And it is. And in fact, whatever we put our mind and our heart to, it is possible because when you move towards it, you suddenly opportunity comes, people come. And, and if you keep creating the momentum, you will get there. You just need to hang on. Go for that crazy ride. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, a lot of people don't quite have the vision past tomorrow or a couple of years. So it will be really hard for them to have, you know, 2020 vision. And obviously when it comes to um, the speaking and the mindset stuff that you teach them, that's a whole different di dimension that they've got to look way beyond in their future. So it is, it is something that they, they need to, um, you know, look into. Now, what is it that you, you teach people, like you said in the first quarter is a lot of mindset is a lot of, you know, prepping for them to go, um, onto the mic. Um, what, what, what would somebody come and learn, um, before they can start speaking? Well, like I was saying, removing blocks is, is the first part. Right. Imagination, imagination training, which is what elite athletes use, and in fact, Anthony Robbins touts about it all the time. Um, creating the vision, you know. So what you were just saying then, if we can't see 
that we can't see the future and that's often one of the aspects that holds people back. But practicing morning and night, creating that vision, in fact, starting to play with it. What does it look like? What does it look like when I'm up speaking to someone? What do the audience look like? You know, and we put ourselves into state, into that state. Another aspect is uh, claiming our expert status which a lot of people are really frightened of, saying that they're a speaker. So I encourage them to go to their social media pages and start talking about, I'm doing this training and I'm going to be uh, available to speak. If you can't step into the, if you can't straight away say, I am a speaker, you can at least say, after this training, I'm going to be looking for places to speak. And they start to accept that. Then we move into, um, okay, I want to just tell you something. In the 18th century, when theatre and plays were really big, that's when public speaking apparently began in the Victorian era. And at the time it was very stylized, I guess because it was all about theatre in those days. So when I say stylized, the gestures when they were speaking were to deliver the message. So it might be if they wanted to say to the audience, I am surprised. They would be really dramatic, open their eyes and go, as if to say, like they go, I am surprised. Like they wanted the audience to feel it. And a lot of that still exists today, although less gimmicky, but we still have cookie cutter style of gesturing, which is being taught, which is we have to stay within this box so it's just above the belly button and we're not meant to put our arms out wider than this unless it's really to demonstrate it is so big or I am so overwhelmed um, you notice Donald Trump does this a lot as well yeah he's actually trained in public speaking if you watch him you can see he's doing the cookie cutter style he knows when to open his eyes and give us the whites of his eyes like he's surprised or you know, yes, I'm very, I'm, I'm interested, I'm listening. Just watch one day, it's funny. But because the audience now is very discerning and they're tired of being coerced into how they should feel and respond to a speaker, and it's very uh, predictive, public speaking is really predictive, our audiences now have evolved and they want a more naturalised style of speaking. They want to see the real person. They want our unique quirks and foibles. They want to see us. They want to hear our burning message, our theory of change, and they want to see us be real. They want, us, they want to know, are you fed income? Are you the real thing? And so what I teach is next after removing blocks, after imagination training and after... Um, stepping into your authentic state, what we then learn is, what are your natural gestures? What do you do naturally? So for example, Prosper, if I wanted to teach you, I'd say, okay, Prosper, could you get up now? And I want you to demonstrate with gestures, going to the shop and asking the woman where the tomato sauce is on the top aisle and can someone help you get it, for example. And you would do that, and then I would ask you, would you do it again and think about what gestures you would like to bring from your authentic state to emphasise the story? So we are still performing, but from what we choose, gestures that we choose, not the gestures that we've been told, like um, it's small, it's big, because... In my groups with the women, you can see there's a whole array of gestures that aren't stock standard. And it's beautiful. It's like watching music in flow when a woman's just gesturing naturally. Naturally. Absolutely. <clears throat> Since you started talking about that, I just really had to check in with my body language and just to see how it's all going. But, you know, now that I know we have to be gesturing, you know, I'm going to try as much as possible but all of this has to be learned right it's 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 pretty amazing um how are you putting it all together well obviously there's quite a lot to learn and nobody's going to learn everything in the one um you know episode and i'm thinking people have heard your story people have heard your unique take in in this whole thing with that um you know the cookie cutter way that the 
the theater had, um, you know, crafted how people are supposed to be. I still have one thing that just came to me right now. Obviously, we have become sort of a personalized um, you know, um, society, just like what you're talking about. And people are now anticipating, you know, my UEisms and your UEisms and my own quirks and personalities and stuff. Does this also translate that we're no longer on the big stage, but you are now on maybe Facebook Live? That also constitutes part of yes. speaking to an audience and also a yes. video like this. We could have either a million views or we could have one view. All of that is is part of being on some sort of platform or some sort of stage. So if you can just touch up on that a little bit before we, um, you know, um, close off this episode. Sure. Um, yes, we have the event of video. Video is what's expected now. So if we get a video that looks like a template, do you know what I mean? So, all right. So you go on YouTube, you'll see all those um, advertisements at the beginning and it's like, hi, here I am in my office, which is the beach at the back or a beautiful home or there's another one in the, in the um, rural landscape and they talk about how to make you 100K, but it's a template and they use the same gestures. It's, it's predictive, right? And so we switch off, our brain switches off. So it's really important. I, Prosper, one of my most popular videos was sitting in bed when I got home after an event, I'd taken my makeup off, pulled my hair back, and I thought, oh, I really need to share this message with my audience. I got my most hits because people were seeing behind the scenes, the real, the real fur, not the fur that's performing or on stage. And that's what people want. It isn't to say that we're not professional and we can't script a talk. We can do all of that, but at the same time, be real. Really, I mean, our audience love us more when we're real and they're more forgiving. It's like, even if you're nervous, but you dare to speak, our audience is going to say, wow, I can't even do that. That's great. But if we try and fake it, we're fake. We're fake. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't have made an effort then for that. I mean, obviously... <laughs> Just one more thing. I remember I used to do it right. So I used to say to me, oh, you're a bit posh, you're a bit well-spoken, or look at your gestures, you know. And then I tried to hide that and be more generic. And I discovered that a lot of women do this in order to be accepted. Oh, be really my. generic. Yeah. So it's gone. It's out. We don't do that anymore. Absolutely. Mm. Well, this, mm. this episode has been remarkable. And I, um, yeah, I really am excited that this is actually one of the first ones. And it's going to set the standard of the quality of shows that we're going to be uh, putting out there. And if you're watching this show right now, you would appreciate that Dr. Fur has really laid it down what it is and what it takes for you to be, do, and become a speaker of notes that people can actually hear your message because we're here to live, we're here to learn, we're here to contribute. And um, speaking of contribution, now, Dr. Fur, if people have been watching this and really sitting at the edge of their seat, um, you know, trying to figure out how else can I get, um, you know, to speak like she does and, um, you know, learn a little bit more, how, can, how best can people get a hold of you? Sure. So if you're a woman, um, although I do get guys asking me, it's down the track. I will do mixed groups, but currently I have a meetup prosper and it's a she talks speakers workshop meetup. It's the first Sunday of every month in South Melbourne, free to newcomers. So it's a great opportunity for women to come along and see if it's a fit, but it's packed full of value, absolutely packed. And in fact, every single participant has let over and said to me, you do realize you have something special here. So come and get out. You can grab me on social media. I'm, I'm everywhere, including Snapchat. Um, she talks and just ask me, you'll see the events on the she talks page as well. And then if you want to follow up on from there, you can do one-to-one -one mentoring. Or we can do group mentoring. I do half day, full day, two day workshops at this stage. Later in, I think, 2019, I might start a retreat. Yeah. Absolutely. That's it. 
absolutely yeah. that would be so perfect and i'm going to be putting in all the co contact details right at the bottom and also i would like to invite you uh fair to enlist your events for your meetup on our platform so that when people watch this video okay. they can easily go to the event section and then they can pick it up yes. from there so i will help you out as soon as you with this so no. international women's day harmony day melbourne day yeah and oh, hang on international women's day how many day Melbourne day, Melbourne knowledge week. There are four events this year on key dates. So look out for those. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you want to be involved, if you want to be a speaker or come on and support, just give me a hoy. Was that for me or for the other women watching? Oh, for the other women, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much. Thank you so much for that. Um, obviously, uh, you have brought in so much value to this show. Um, you've set the standard of 2018, and I really, really applaud you for your time, your knowledge, and your expertise um, on this episode there, Fair. Now, one last thing. There's a lot of women that would have woken up on the 1st of January and say, 2018 is my year. I'm gonna do this. I'm bigger, better, stronger, faster, prettier, skinnier, healthier, and I'm gonna be and do things that I've never done in my life. What's that one thing you would want to just impart onto them so that you know we leave them on the straight and narrow and they know that you know whatever they're dreaming of can be achieved? Okay, so the main thing is we tend to get the inspiration, the enthusiasm, and then as life creeps in, as survival creeps in, we put it on the back burner. You cannot put it on the back burner. You need to start now so that you need to do one thing every day to create the momentum towards the dream. And if you don't know what that is, you just do something or you phone a friend or you, do you know what I mean? Like you just find someone you find, what is my next step? And if it's not the right next step, then you'll, you'll do it anyway because it will it will show itself to you but you have to create the momentum every day and stay inspired to your vision entertain that vision every day absolutely absolutely well thank you so much for your time on this episode today and hopefully see you at your other speaking gigs that you're going to be doing throughout the year thank you so much absolutely i look forward to it thanks prosper you're doing great work i love being on your show thank you Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.